Oh, I gotta grab that. I know me, I'll get cotton mouth. Cotton mouth, motherfucker? Yeah, I will. <sighs> Hi. What's up, homie? How are you? Uh, Hi. Good. So, welcome back to the deep gripping reality. Uh, this one's a little weird, because like, you know, it's either on my phone, it's these awesome cameras, or now it's my iPhone. I, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> nobody cares. Anyway, so those who haven't been here, this is Ginger, I'm Steve. This is the Deep Gripping Reality Podcast where I talk about marketing and I talk about business, I talk about technology a lot and trends. And behind me, we have Mr. Mark Zuckerberg and Lex Friedman. If you haven't seen the Lex Friedman Podcast, it's one of my favorites, very, very cool show. Uh, he gets a lot of famous people, he gets a lot of politicians, and they have very intimate conversations. Um, it's, it's really a gold standard for podcasting. Uh, recently, literally today, uh, he had Mark Zuckerberg on for the third time. Uh, and the image that's here, the reason that the camera's set up the way it is and all that is because that's not real. Now, those of you who are tech nerds may have noticed after it's been sitting here a while, especially comparing it to me and him, and now that I'm up super close to it, I can tell it's not real. And there it goes. That was fast. Well, everything shuts down. You're gonna love that. What's gonna come up now, do you know? A not connected sign. You know what it is? <laughs> I talked bad about the Zuck. Shit. This is what it Don't happens. ever talk bad about the Zuck. No, there he is. So, um, and we happened to, we wanted to get a shot where they're both on screen and that happened to be the caption, so you're welcome. Um, but what's interesting about this is they both have the MetaQuest Pro on. Uh, they have had themselves scanned. The, the, this is kind of a tech demo because even though it's completely capable of being done now, um, they both had to have very comprehensive scans using some pretty sophisticated technology. The interview is being done from hundreds of miles away from each other, if not thousands, uh, maybe even in different states. But as the interview goes on, the motion tracking in the eyes removes the uncanny valley because anytime he blinks, anytime he winks, all of this stuff has been digitally captured so that even though Zuck has his hair a little bit longer, maybe he hasn't shaved, digitally he looks like this. And during this interview, I highly recommend that you watch it. During this interview, Lex comments several times on how he just, he doesn't, uh, he can't get over the fact that they're not actually in the same room. It feels like they are. Um, the video starts with a full body part of it. Now, where's this technology going? Um, ultimately, you'll be able to take an iPhone, which has the built-in LiDAR uh, detector, which can tell depth, and you'll do a quick scan of your face, maybe make a couple faces so it knows what you look like when you're making expressions, and then read through a script so it understands how your unique face moves making certain words. From then on, this all gets rendered in real time. This is what you would see. It's crazy. Between that and the announcement recently uh, in MetaConnect yesterday of, um, of AI characters, so for example, Snoop Dogg, the Dungeon Master, brilliant, um, Mr. B uh, Mr. Beast likeness, all these celebrities that they've partnered with that will use AI so you can have a conversation with a caricature or character that's based on them. Um, this conversation goes pretty deep into, well, you, you can pull this up and feel like you're in the same room with a family member that's hundreds of miles or on the other side of the globe, and that's amazing. I remember the first time that you and I both had uh, MetaQuest 2, and we sat in that conference room there was a moment where we're like, okay, we gotta sit next to each other, we gotta fist bump, we gotta handshake, you know what I mean? Because even though you know, there is just this odd thing where it's like, it's really cool that it's tracking me this closely. Now, when it tracks even your imperfections and your smiles, it removes that. What if your AI, your, your likeness, whatever your voice, you train a model and it understands how you would react in situations or things that you would say and you pass away and your family can then talk to AI likeness of you. There's a lot of ethical implications there, of course, but like, I don't know, I, I was just really blown away. What, what were your thoughts when I showed you this? Credit card fraud is never gonna get easier. <laughs> you know, that's a fair point. They actually, in this interview, they talk about, you know, it's easy to scam people on the internet now. Yeah, imagine when you can do whatever you want. Well, and social engineering, like, I'm sure, have you seen that viral video where the woman is there at some big uh, tech thing and this guy from, from um, I don't know, he's like from CNN or some, some news company and he's like, he's their tech correspondent and he's at this big thing and he's like, yeah, you're not going to get my credit card information. He's like, mm, I can get your credit card information, your cell phone, the last four of your social and your, your wife's name. That's what this woman says. And he's like, yeah, okay. 
And so she goes, watch. And she pulls up YouTube and she cues up the sound of a, of a crying baby in the background. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, my husband had me call and, and I don't know what's going on. And she's the, the woman that she's talking to on the other end is being recorded. Yeah. And she's like, she's like, yeah, all I have is, is um, this, this, this information. And it's stuff that she got from publicly available information. And she's like, so I just need to know, you know, his phone number, the phone number he has on account because I want to make sure I'm on there. She said the she ended up in less than less than five minutes. She was able to get herself added as an authorized user. She was able to change the password, so remove access for him. And you just see the guy, the reporter's just like, you just you watch the blood drain from his face. Now imagine if you're in a video conference with somebody and it's photorealistic like this, and it's not you. And the AI has gone so far that you can change the voice to sound like the person. I mean, I think most people have adapted a uh, minnow kind of mentality. Like, if there's a million, like millions of us, just make sure we don't stand out and then our ship won't get taken because we don't have the resources to protect from all the shit we don't understand in the first place. And, like, you know, to be fair, most people don't have enough money to be worth targeting. True. And by the time you have that kind of money, you can pay people to protect it for you. Right. Yeah. But there is a middle ground there between. Uh, having billions of dollars in as much security as you want and having zero dollars and living impoverished. And that middle class would be the target, frankly, yeah. as they typically are. Granted, how much of the middle class is left in America, that's a whole different discussion, but that would be the target, I would assume, if yeah. you're trying to find people to scam old boomers with money still somehow. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you just say, I mean, you, you still, you hear about this all the time. Um, people from, you know, Nine times out of ten, it's a, it's a call center in India that's running this scam. Sure. And it's an Amazon refund, and they say, click this link to do an Amazon refund. You call the number, and they literally have a fake copy of your bank's yep. website. You enter in your data, and it's, it's all social engineering, but they, now imagine if they're like, let's jump on a video call so that you can see that I am who I say I am, and you can trust me. I mean, the thing that removed the uncanny valley for me on this was watching as the eyes are darting back and forth and he's blinking and it's not AI assuming when it's going to happen. It's the cameras inside the headset tracking his actual eye movements. And when he, so it knows how he smiles. And even though it's not tracking necessarily down here because the, the crow's feet on the eyes, they know there's, you've got the, the smile. So it, it's just, it's weird because I don't know, there's something about this. It's like somebody commented on this video, by the way, looks like Lex and Mark finally reached their true form. <laughs> couple of robots <laughs> I mean the the beautiful side of this is that the government will now know that you were smiling when they drone struck you <laughs> sad but true no I don't think it's necessarily gonna get used for any of that but there are a lot of implications and it's it's a question of how to manage that you know like again we were, we were talking about this you're young there are people that uh, obviously get into porn sites before the age of 18 by telling those sites that they are 18 what happens when it's this realistic you know what I mean? There, there isn't uh, as much of a distance as there was for us. Us. Anyway. Quote, unquote. Yeah. <laughs> Our, generation. Our generation. Let's put it that way. Fair enough. Yeah. But no, I agree with you. And I think, you know, you brought up something about attachment. You know, if you're talking to, because what we have here is there, there's the emerging technology of AI that's building and these personalities that are using these LLMs, large language models, to predict what should be said. Yeah. And are sounding more and more human. Yeah. and passing more and more tests that make them sound human that you can't really tell, you couple that with voice technology that is becoming more and more realistic where I can type up a script and it'll say in whatever voice I want exactly how I would say it with the nuances, then couple it with this. And I think there is a risk of people essentially falling in love with or... So you've, you've seen the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix and... No, but I've heard about it. Do me a favor and tell me a little bit. That was the whole plot line is that they create an AI that basically just lives in your ear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's just an earpiece you wear, and it's an AI custom built to be your significant other that'll hear everything and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, that's such a hard time. You know, just in every way. Wow. There for you. Yeah. And it was this weird, lonely uh, movie that dealt with that whole scenario of Joaquin Phoenix as the protagonist. But those emotional attachments to not humans is going to be an interesting aspect that we never dealt with, you no. know? And we never even thought about it, except for, you know, people who wrote movies like that. Yeah, the weirdest version of that we saw was people that are like, 
you know, dog is man's best friend, and we're like, they sh sure, why not? Why yeah. not? People want to marry their Sims partner, you know, <laughs> on the I, Sims. Yeah. You know, there was weird stuff like that, the Second Life characters, that sort of thing. But even then, you're still dealing with humans. Yeah. You're not dealing with chatbots or robots or anything like that. Yeah, and then, and then the question becomes, at what point is AI conscious? Uh, what, at what point do we accord it rights? Yeah. Um, That's the, the singularity type of thing. Well, so that brings up another thing. One of the fundamental questions they asked very early on in this interview that got me thinking is, what is reality? Okay, and that sounds like a silly question to ask. A shared hallucination. Essentially, I mean, here's the thing, virtual reality versus the real world, right? He, Lex admits, and this guy's got a couple PhDs, super smart guy, he admits that the line gets so blurred that many times he's like, I completely forget that we're in this digital world. And, and Zuck's just kind of smirking because he's like, yeah, that's that's the point. We want people to be able to connect. But, you know, at what point do you become so emerged that we're not talking like everybody always says Ready Player One. I never saw the movie. I don't care to. But I get the concept of it, that you're so immersed that the, that the real world doesn't even really matter to you anymore. And, you know, I wonder about if people are forming these attachments to these AI, whatever, you know, is it at the expense of real people? Are they becoming more antisocial because that one person is an echo chamber and tells them exactly what they want to hear? I can see that Ready, Ready Player One also would have been a best case scenario because the beauty of that movie is that it's dealing with hardcore fantasy, right? So we're, we're not dealing with anything that resembles reality. When you're in that game, in you know, Ready Player One, like, it's clear that it's a fantasy. This, is, this isn't clear. Mm -hmm. Like, this could be a scenario where you scan the youngest version of yourself that you want, and even as you age, you just retain whatever version you like that looks realistic, and you can form semi-realistic connections with people where maybe they're bots and you don't even know it. And that's the other part is who, who is real, you know? That's, that's tough. And, you know, he talks about how neither... One of Zuckerberg's big, biggest criticisms that he gets from people is that he's, he's not human enough in how he, you know, smiles or how he emotes. Sure. And, he talks about how when you have these AI avatars that you're able to create, it's essentially like a digital photograph that's just 3D, right? So you can go days without shaving, you can have a full beard, and when you go to log in, you still look like your best self. But what if you want to improve your smile and you want to make your smile a little more attractive? You can go in and tweak that a little bit, make it so that when you smile, it's a nicer smile than what you think you have. So again, what is reality? You know, if, if you meet somebody, say we're in, we'll say we're five, 10 years from now, and this is the norm, instead of Zoom, even Zoom has their own version of this, where you're meeting people, it's their digital avatar, everybody's accepted that it's their digital avatar. What happens when you get to a point, like catfishing people just became a very real thing because you meet somebody in there, and even if it is a human behind it, and it's not AI, you remove all that, but you've got their digital likeness, and you meet them in real life, they look nothing like their digital likeness. I mean, that's... Well, is, is monogamy as a concept gonna get destroyed? You know what I mean? I don't know, because that's, a, that's an ethical thing. That's a no, moral no, thing. Like, too, are people you know? going to consider this cheating? I would assume so. Because, I mean, a part of You the... would, but do you think younger generations would? That's a fair point. Because you and I, yeah. Because they're yeah. not real. It's a bot, even if it's custom tailored. Yeah. Is it really cheating if it's a different species, essentially? I don't know. I think that, that comes into the emotional attachment side. I mean, I think... Maybe I'm wrong, but I think most people would say if there's an emotional attachment or an emotional detachment from your partner for whatever period of time, that's that's cheating. You know what I mean? But I guess it's it's very subjective. It's very culturally subjective, you know? Um, I don't know, it, it's it's a very weird area, and I never really, I thought of it as, yeah, I know they're working on this stuff. I've seen him share little videos of this, but then watching these get rendered in real time, and yeah. I've seen a lot of what's happening with, uh, because the, what we're not showing you with this video is that it cuts many times between this conversation and showing them in their respective places with, with an external camera that shows them in the headset, and then it shows the rainbow-looking grid of what the data points that it has, the model. So you see exactly how it's being rendered in real time. Yeah. And I don't know, I think it's, we're in a weird precipice that I never thought we'd get into. I mean. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. You and I grew up, we watched The Matrix, mm -hmm. and we thought, wow, what a concept. Zuckerberg clearly watched it and thought, Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Challenge accepted. That's what Zuck thought. Well, everybody robot. thought he was crazy when he bought Meta, or when he bought uh, Oculus. Right. They thought it was stupid. Why is he getting into gaming? He's a social media guy. He's, he's very pro-robot. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of weird. I wonder if you peel his face back. 
the, <laughs> is the Lizard King around? One of my favorite interviews I've ever seen, and it was just a clip. He was talking to kids, and they asked him about something emotional that he went through when he was younger. And he's like, yeah, you know, and, and, and the person had essentially related to him that, yeah, I went through that too, I, it really hurt me. And he goes, he goes, he said something to the effect of, you know, I'm sure that did hurt you, and you were human, and I was human. And, and everybody laughed. Like, because he was human. He's like, no, 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 I'm not saying that I'm... And, he, and then he tried to, like, double back and explain. Didn't like of just, the implication. Of yeah, like instead that. of just rolling off, and letting it roll off his back, like, okay, yeah, haha, that's funny. Everybody knows I'm a lizard man, whatever. He's like, no, 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 I'm not saying I wasn't... Like, he almost panics. It's like, dude, you're not helping yourself. It just reminds me of, uh, you remember James Spader did that cameo in The Office? Yes. Where they were, like, trying to get him at the end of it, and he goes, you don't even know my real fucking name. I'm the fucking Lizard King. And that was, like, <laughs> that's all I can think of when I see Zuck is James Spader delivering the line. I'm, you don't even know who I am. I'm the fucking Lizard King. I'm telling you, I've watched a lot of a lot of these. I watched the first two. This is the third interview that he did with Zuckerberg. Yeah. And the first two were in person. Yeah. And I watched the way that their eyes go when they talk, and I watch a lot of it's research for what we do. But... Uh, his eyes in this look more real than his real interviews do. So maybe he created a universe where it can be human. <laughs> I mean, maybe he's some sentient AI from the future that's going back to, to make it all work the way he needs it to. I don't know, it's weird. It's, a, it's such, I keep saying this, it's such a weird time because I get excited about this stuff. I think that, you know, at a $500 price point, the, the MetaQuest 3 is coming out in, I think it's like October 10th or 11th or something, they just announced it. And there's going to be two of them. There's going to be one at like a $500 price point and one at like six fifty dollars or something. The difference is the amount of memory and speed. It's going to be comfortable. It's going to be exciting. But what's really cool about it, this is what I'm excited about. It has mixed reality capabilities that are really cool. So in other words, you can be playing a game, you double tap your headset, and because there's front-facing cameras as well, in full color immersive, you have those items. And you can it tracks your hands perfectly. So you can, like say you and I are, are we're playing... Um, MTG Arena would be a genius thing to put into this because imagine I have cards here and my hand goes like this. I'm looking down. I can see my cards. You can see yours. We have a digital table here. There are no physical cards. We're just passing them back and forth. You double tap and then there's special effects that are popping up. Now, will Wizards of the Coast do anything with this? Fuck no. Are they stupid not to? Yes, very much so. No one's accused them of being smart in a very long time, Steve. <laughs> I'm just saying, but imagine that. How cool would that be if the next like, version be... of Arena would be... You and I sitting across from each other playing with it, it takes the best aspects of paper magic and do you ever watch uh, like the old Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh shows the, the cartoons you know what I mean when we were young yes it would be like realizing that finally where you can like walk around through an island and like battle people and like, yeah that would be fucking dope that would be the realization of a childhood dream of mine yeah it'd be awesome will it happen I don't Doubt it, but some card game will eventually get in there, and it may be the one that actually takes over. Is yep. the you know first to market that goes and looks at it and says, "Hey, we could create a whole different level of of you know battling on here." Well, they already have a thing have things with this mixed reality tech where we can play chess. There's no chessboard in front of either of us, but we both are looking at the same chessboard with the same pieces from our perspectives, and we're moving them, and it's tracking it all in real time. So I mean, I think it'll it, it there's a lot of opportunity for immersion there. I love the idea of, and I know that uh, Microsoft did this with their HoloLens quite a while ago, where you could build uh, in Minecraft in your living room with your living room being there on the table and stuff. I mean, I think the mixed reality side is really cool. I think that the business application of it would be really cool, because instead of two curved monitors, you can have full screen monitors, and because it's so seamlessly integrated with your actual room, it doesn't give you the headache. You don't get the virtual reality you know, sickness, the dizziness that you get with that. I mean, it's, it's, and it's tracking your hand, so you don't even need a keyboard anymore. Mm. Um, that it's, so I, I think that, and the price point is the thing that gets me. I mean, 500 bucks, yeah, that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but for a certain niche, it's not. It's very doable. And as we saw with the Quest 2, as the technology continues to evolve, the price is going to continue to come down, and the barrier to entry is, I mean, for, for new users. Eventually, you'll pull one out of a scrapyard. Well, I mean, it, kind of. I mean, I, I'm thinking about it like this. You and I have been remote working for a total of almost, what, four years now, right? Almost four. Yeah, it's been a minute now. Since, since 2020 for you and before that for me, right? I think 2019 was when we introduced it, actually. Perfect. So remote working is something you and I have both been doing for quite a long time. Yeah. This removes the excuse 
that you can't remote work. Like bosses are always like, well, I like to see you in person. I like to get together and spend time with you. Well, if it feels like you're right there and the only difference is we can't physically shake hands, but he's shown even in other tech demos that they have gloves and stuff that have haptic feelings that it literally feels like you're picking up a ball. Like it's just. I can't wait to create a robot that can shake a boss's hand for me. <laughs> so you don't have to? <laughs> that works. You know, one that just goes up and is like, hey, yeah, whatever you said I needed to do, it's done. Yeah, ta-da, and it's literally just a robot with a hand. Just shake it. No, it's, I, I get a kick out of it. I think that, you know, we could take the technology talk and go into, like, the work talk and with all the strikes and stuff, but I saw another short recently where it was, this guy was sitting back on a performance review and you just see him getting really nervous and stuff, and the boss says, uh, you know, last two years in a row, you've really kind of slipped, and, and I've noticed that your production has continued to go down. I mean, you're meeting the goals, but it's not quite where we'd like you to be. We'd like you to go above and beyond. And uh, do you have an explanation for that? He goes, yep. In 2020, I was the top performing employee in the entire company. I asked you for a raise, and you said no, and I understood because it was my first year in 2021 and 2022. Same thing happened, except you told me that I was getting the share market value, and then I asked what the median of the share market value for my role was, and you said that I was slightly below that. So if you're going to pay me the, av the, the amount of an average employee uh, in the market, and you're not going to pay me higher than market value work, then why do you expect me to go above and beyond to perform beyond my job duties? when I'm not worth that to you, even though I'm continually, continuously the top performing person in the entire company. And then she's just like, you can hear the HR guy, lady just die. Cause she's like, uh, hmm. Turns out, turns out that whole uh, fuck around and find out piece, the finding out's happening. I actually had a friend recently that uh, he, he was performing excellently at his job, right? He had two bosses, one directly above him, and then the boss of the overall organization. Now, the boss of the overall organization loved him, loved his work. The boss above him just didn't like his personality, didn't like how he flowed, like, just she wasn't about it, right? Mm -hmm. So she would always find reasons to, like, hey, we need to talk more about this or that, and just kind of tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak. And eventually, it came to a head uh, when she basically said, you know, we, we need to sit down and uh, go over how we're going to improve your work over the next month because I'm not satisfied with it. Right after he had gotten, you know, his the boss above both of them was like, this is amazing work, great job. Yeah, rave and, reviews. And he, did, he looked at her and he just went, counter, counter offer, two weeks. <laughs> wow, that's good for him. And I'm like, yeah, that's where we're getting to though. We're, we're getting to a point where we have a generation and I, I, it cracks me up because I've heard so many boomers, you know, complain like they just don't want to work. Like, nah, we're just not gonna work for a pittance. Like we're, we're done with that. It was it was one of the funnier stories I ever saw was this company that was like, we had to go, like the two bosses at the top, mm -hmm. had to go and load up this entire truck because nobody would do it for twelve fifty an hour. And so the internet, they posted up online, you know, just bitching about it and they got flamed for it, okay. as, as they should. Yeah. They're like, well, what's the what's the value of the labor? Like twelve fifty. like, so did you make twelve fifty an hour doing it? Well, no, we made our salaries. Clearly that's what the value of the work was because no one else would do it. I, I do believe that uh, it would make a lot of sense for, and especially in larger companies, and it'll never happen, but I would love to see some of these upper management assholes go to these roles that are vital for their organization and try to perform what they do at their expertise level on their pay for a month. And not having access to their personal funds, not having access to anything that they, any of the luxuries that they have, and just try to survive. And it's, it's wild. I mean, it's why we have the Writers and the Actors Guild strikes right now, you know? And yes, they're coming to whatever, but... Yeah, I think the general rule, of, I think there are two general rules of thumb that would be good to implement, and one is based on historical context, like you said, where you have to live on the salary of the lowest paid employee and do that work for a specific period of time so you understand what you are, in, like, inflicting yeah. upon people. The other one that I think is necessary and would be the simplest resolution because people are like, you know, billionaires shouldn't make billions. You know, we should tax them above X percent. But here's the problem. We have inflation, we have money and numbers moving constantly, right? So wherever we put the landmark, it's gonna eventually have to move. Yep. Or you make one that's algorithmically based. Mm -hmm. And you make it very simple. You just say whatever the lowest paid employee is, the highest paid employee, and that includes the CEO, can only make 10 times that. Now we are living in the same world. Yeah. When somebody makes 400 times what you make, and let's say you make 40,000. Completely different world. 
they're not living in your world anymore. They don't understand what your needs are. They have no idea what you're does you, they have no idea what you're going through. Yeah. They're removed from your reality. Well, the numbers are different. If you tell somebody they're going to get a twenty thousand dollar raise, that's life changing for most people. Right. But if you tell the big bosses a lot of times that they're only going to get twenty thousand dollar, and to them it's the word only. It's like God damn it, what did we do? You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's to them it's. I don't know. You're right. It's it's completely a different world. But but if I said, okay, your lowest employee makes forty thousand, ten mm -hmm. x that's four hundred thousand. That is still a decent salary. I don't yeah. I don't see where there's room to bitch about four hundred thousand a year. No, I don't make that. No, if you're making, and I'm still happy with what I make. Exactly. You know I mean? If you're, I know that in Iowa, it's different in every state. And I just recently saw this on Forbes. In Iowa, if you're making, I think it's like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, you are in the top. Like I want to say one percent. And if you're Tim Reynolds, you go up thirty million a year for some reason. Like well, it's, there is a there is a major dis detachment, and I think the funny part is a lot of this information is publicly available, but people don't know a where to look and b that they should look. For example, you want to ever make yourself sick, go look and see what school superintendents make versus the teachers. I've done it. That's or versus brutal. the custodians. I mean, we're talking quarter of a million dollars a year versus. Anything. You know, yeah, or, or forget the teachers even, because the teachers, believe it or not, they do get paid pretty well, and a lot of times they get random bonuses just because, okay? Which a lot of people are going to probably catch some heat for that, but it's the truth. You're going to catch some hands for that. <laughs> for, I mean, I'm, I, trust me, I want them all to get paid more, but believe it or not, they do well. You have people in the, in, in the office staff in these situations a lot of times who will get like a, a 3% raise, Yeah. get like nothing, literally a quarter, a dollar here or there. Right, and that may sound okay until you realize that three percent of a quarter million is a lot different than three percent of thirty thousand. Yeah, see what I'm saying? There's a big difference there. I personally believe that if your raises from a company are not equal to or higher than the rate of inflation, you're failing massively. Also, that argument there is why we can't have flat tax rates because ten percent of First thirty thousand somebody makes is much more vital than the ten percent from the next three million. Yeah, yeah. It's, Flat tax rates shouldn't be a thing. Progressive has to happen, but it's it's a law of diminishing returns. So I, I don't know. It's there's a lot of fallacies. I know we've gotten off that topic, but I think it's important to discuss this, especially considering we've got um, auto workers that have been that have been on strike. We've got auto manufacturing getting shut down all over the place because of this. A little at a time, which by the way squeeze method that they've been using is genius. Instead of just saying everybody's going on strike on this date, they're like, no, we're going to start with these, and if we don't get what we want by this time, then we're going to add these that are going on strike. I'll add the pressure. And then these. And it's like, that is genius. I don't know if it's ever happened before. I don't know if it hasn't. And if it hasn't, I don't know why, because it's so smart. You can say, no, seriously, this is how much manufacturing you've just lost. How many millions of dollars does that cost you? Oh, yeah, well, we're going to shut down this factory and this one next, and then we're coming for this place. That's... Oof, that's the, a genius. The downside to it is if you implement that, you also give those people time to figure out how they're going to retaliate. Are they going to just start hiring people in advance to try to fill that role when the union pulls out? Not if they don't know which factories you're going to take. Correct. You have to be careful. I'm, <laughs> saying, I'm saying when you tell your opponent what you're going to yeah. do, you're giving away a lot of information. And I'm not saying it's the wrong move, but I'm saying that's probably why it isn't typically done. Yeah, yeah. I just think it's, it's, it's smart. I think that we're... At a very weird place and, and this is something that I recently came to realize so in America we haven't been tied to gold for a very long time our cash our money yeah you know it used to be that you could literally give a dollar and it would be good for one troy ounce of gold yeah a dollar was defined as one troy ounce of gold you can go to any bank be like here's a dollar give me gold yeah it's not tied to that anymore it hasn't been for a very long time which means we can literally paint paint print all the money that we need as the government okay so this line that we don't have money for universal health care, for uh, college tuition, is bullshit. Because they're always like, where are we going to get the money? What are we going to cut? What are we going to... The, the, right now, as we Fucking record military. this... military. That's what we cut. That's exactly. So as we record this, there is a budget hang-up, and they're going to end up shutting down the government this weekend, most likely because of a few holdout people that have a death grip, and they're far, far to one side of the spectrum. It's the stupidest thing, right? And the funniest part about it is, again, they never ask... Where are we going to get the money for those tanks? We have the military has to have this much money. No, no question about it. They just print that money. I'm not, it's, I'm not even worried about the money. Where are we going to get the war 
for these things. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. We, we don't have to go to war all the time, guys. We can take a year or two off. But to be fair, I have a whole set of, of baking supplies and knives. I don't bake shit in my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. have the tools. But do we? Do you need a new set every year? Probably not. That would be the difference. Yeah. Probably. Your your shit's probably like five plus years old, and it's yeah. there in case you need it. We could take somewhat of a similar approach with a lot of our shit. Yeah. You know, like, we, we have so much of it that we have to dump some of it. We've had, remember when they had the uh, individual police stations got paid by the government to just hold some of the shit that they had in inventory because they yeah. didn't have room for it anymore? Yeah. They had to get new shit? I do remember that, yeah. That was yep. wild. Like, they rolled a fucking tank out on us at Visha in Iowa State. A fucking tank rolled down the streets at Visha. I ran, drunk I as hell. <laughs> I was like, nah. I stumbled the hell out of there. I was like, not today, fam. Not dying for this shit. It's, it's so Marshalltown <laughs> actually bought a, the town I live in, they bought a while back a SWAT deployment vehicle. Yeah. An armored freaking truck. They bought it from the National Guard. Yep. It was a surplus thing. They bought it for a dollar. Yep. A dollar! But yep. I, it just, it just, it's crazy. I mean, there's so many things that could be better, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier to divide people politically. It's a lot easier to have people struggle and let certain people thrive. But what I just don't understand and I can't wrap my brain around is, you know, we went from being one of the most innovative countries in the world, the most innovative country in the world, because everybody was getting good education. And at some point, the people who got that education were like, yeah, you know what? Sure, it's a little cheaper to go to this stupider countries well now those stupider countries a lot of times will have free education yeah and now they're more innovative and sure their labor is going to be cheaper but you know they say we don't make anything here anymore you know what the the most the biggest most significant world changing inventions to come from america are open ai facebook youtube google amazon all these tech companies that have changed the world and every single one of them either has ivy league people that were behind it really smart people or people who are in Ivy League figured out what they needed to know and dropped out after they made a ton of money, right? So, but at least they're you know choking each other. Get, true, there is that. Virtually, there is that. Vir virtually, for, and for fun, for the amusement of it. Yeah, <laughs> this it's it's a weird world we live in, and, and the funny part is, as much as we bitch about it on a podcast, I think the only thing that we can do is figure out how to how to get ahead with the tools that we. OpenAI was founded with the idea of having open visibility and all this, and then Microsoft dumps billions into it, and you know, how much of it is actually open, I don't know, there's, there's paywalls or whatever. But what it comes down to is, those who have the best, and this is gonna be so counter-argument, those who have the best tools are the ones who thrive, those who understand how to use those tools are the ones who become invaluable. So for example, <laughs> that's awesome. Me knowing how to use OpenAI and use ChatGPT and use all these AI tools before any of our competitors gives us a competitive advantage. Sure. Me knowing how to use the free version to its limit and then have the paid version to make sure I fully understand it gives us an advantage. Sure. But is it enough of an advantage for the average person to learn how to use these free tools to better themselves that you can tip the scales? Or are the scales so tipped that there's not even one side of it anymore? Well, what you've guaranteed is mostly that you aren't living in poverty, not that you're rich. Yeah. That's the difference. Like, we're clinging to the last vestiges of the middle class with a death grip. That's the sad thing. It's like everybody, nobody's happy being in, like, living in, con being content. Well, people who cobbled shoes two generations ago could buy a house, a car, and feed four kids. <laughs> True, and only one of them had to go. The right. mom could stay home if they wanted. Like, be between us, we have uh, over half a million in debt and over four degrees. That's a lot of credentials and a whole lot of money spent to get them. Mm -hmm. But are we really middle class even? Mm -hmm. I don't consider myself that. No. I would say lower middle class at best. Yeah. Yeah. And yet well, my, the knowledge base we have is not bad, to say the least. Yeah. I mean, it's... It, I... I and this is a thing with the deep driven reality. I've always been a fan of, and I've always been a uh, an advocate for getting really, really, really fucking good at a very specific set of skills. Right. Because then you become invaluable. And even if you're not invaluable with this this company, it's very easy for you to find somebody else who can do that because then you have proof. And I I wonder if 
maybe this is a commentary on society that, that we as a, an American society are so used to getting instant gratification that we're not willing to put in the time to become an expert. We just think we're good enough and that we deserve it and that we've earned it whether we have or not. Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not so sure I would place the blame there. I, I think there are bigger forces at work that have just driven out the middle class and pushed us to this. But instant gratification, it's more of a thing than it used to be. The, there is less patience than there used to be. And part of that is that we now have, in the palm of our hand, endless entertainment at and a moment's knowledge. notice. And knowledge. I don't have to work to get certain knowledge now. I can spend a certain amount of time, if I know what to look for, it's about asking the right questions, I can spend a certain amount of time watching videos or reading stuff very quickly, whereas before I would have to go talk to people in person, or I'd have to go read and research these things individually. Yeah. See what I'm saying? I don't, yeah. I guess that the moral of this episode is eat the rich. Well, you know, let's see if we can get a thumbnail that shows the choking. That's one way to eat the rich. <laughs> so, one thing we didn't cover is how to make AI art, and I will not cover that in this episode, but I'm sure that the thumbnail will. <laughs> I mean, we've got an image. I'm sure I can figure out a way to do it. I'll just ask. I'll ask Bing to do it for me. Stay tuned for more Deep Gripping Reality. Ta-da-bum, ta-da-bum, bum. -da -bum, bum, -da -bum, bum, -da -bum.